a quietness of anticipation. I was going to tell a joke, but I'll tell it later, the Lord willing. I would like to speak to you a little while this afternoon, quite a bit of material, concerning Amos. I've long said concerning preaching the gospel of Christ, that it's good to go to the prophets. As they did their work in the proclamation God gave them to the people of their day. And I'm simply calling this Amos. Courage to speak the truth and expose error. You might want to open to Amos chapter 7 verses 10 through 15. Because in this we have introduced to us why that Amos is a prime example of a person who had the great courage to proclaim God's truth and condemn the error of his day. In Amos 7, 10 through 15, the record reads, Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jer Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to hear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, which is another word for prophet, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. But the prophecy, but prophesy not against any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. Then answered Amos, and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman, and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. It is not always easy to speak when the truth is unpopular and unwelcome. Especially to those who are your friends and family when that truth is unpopular and unwelcome. And we would do well to remember then this great prophet and this would be true many of, the, of many of the prophets who was a courageous pattern or example regarding the courage to speak the truth and as I said at the beginning to oppose error for a little bit let's look at Amos the man look at his background Amos calls himself a herdsman Amos 7, 14, a keeper of sycamore, better sycamine trees, fruit, of fruit like, uh, uh, fig-like fruit, only a much bigger tree. It says in uh, verse 1 that he was among the uh, sheep herders from Tekoa, and that's a relatively, relatively small, insignificant village of Judah at the edge of the wilderness, about 12 and a half miles southeast of Jerusalem. And although he was from Judah, God sent him to prophesy primarily to the northern kingdom. And we see that as we go through Amos. Amos also said that he was not a prophet. And some people may say, well, he, he's a prophet, so how can he say he's not a prophet, Amos 7.14. So I have to ask the question, what, what did he mean when he said that he was not a prophet? Well, he was not a prophet in the sense that he spoke as a profession. That is, he received his livelihood from being a prophet. Because he was a prophet in speaking for God, Amos 7.15. In that time, prophets were often hired by rulers, such as the 450 prophets of Baal, 
uh, or the 400 prophets of Asherah who ate at Jezebel's table. That is, he, she paid them. She kept them. Imagine what they're going to say when it comes to prophesying on her behalf. 1 Kings 18, 19. In other words, Amos didn't make a living in that way. Instead, he earned his living as a herdsman and a dresser of sycamine trees. Also, Amos said that he was not the son of a prophet, Amos 7.14. Again, he was not referring to the fact that his father was not a prophet. We cannot see this in 21st century eyes in an American culture. He was referring instead to what we call, and they are mentioned in the scriptures, as the schools of the prophets where they were actually trained to do the work of prophets. So the sons of the prophets trained under older prophets, 2 Kings 2.15 and chapter 4 and verse 1. Amos is simply saying, I didn't have any of that kind of training. I was out simply earning my living in the way many others no doubt did. And then God called him and said, I want you to go do this. There's a great lesson even in that for all of us. According to our station in life as members of the church, we're all teachers of truth. And then when the opportunity avails itself, we ought to be ready to teach the truth or to expose error. The scripture says that he prophesied during the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, Amos 1.1, 1, 1, 2 Kings 14. 23 through 29. And the scripture says that this man did evil in the sight of the Lord, 2 Kings 14, 24. And yet the nation was actually enjoying a degree of success during his reign, 2 Kings 14, 25 and 28. Uh, this was done not by the might of Jeroboam, but it was the will of God that such take place, 2 Kings 14, 26 through 27. So the nation had been blessed, comparatively speaking, compared to the former years, and the fact it was happening while a wicked king ruled. It's often difficult to find support in criticizing someone, a, a ruler in particular, when you think of how this man did his work, what he was called to do, during times of economic or military success. But this is the position that Amos finds himself in and being sent by God, not as a professional prophet or one who had had professional training, but just a farm boy who was called of God to go speak out against the evils of the northern kingdom and proclaim the truth to them. Now already I think you're seeing why we look at Amos as an example of great courage. There are at least five reasons why it took courage for Amos to speak out in the way that he did. And that's what we want to look at at this time on why that he took courage. First, Amos' message was against everyone. Now you may say, how could that be? But it was. Just read the book and believe the word of God. We sometimes hear the phrase, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And this suggests that we can often find support from even the enemies of those that we criticize. Paul used this tactic to his advantage as he briefly won the support of the Pharisees against the Sadducees, Acts 23, 6 through 10, when it looked like the whole roof was going to fall in as far as the temple was concerned, concerning Paul about to be pulled into pieces. But Amos would have no such allies. He couldn't do what Paul did. His message would have made him the enemy of everybody. He condemned the surrounding nations even. Amos 1, 3, 6, 9, 11, 13, all that in the first chapter. And in chapter 2, verse 1. And then, of course, he condemned his own home nation, the southern kingdom of Judah, Amos 2 and verse 4. He also condemned the nation to which he was sent which was, of course, the northern kingdom of Israel, Amos 2, 6 through 8, and chapter 3, verse 1. So Amos would have no allies among these nations. He had no allies among men. 
in doing what God told him to do. So that's why you need the courage. Second, Amos' message was not politically correct. He would have offended certain people and no doubt did offend certain people in view of our reading at the beginning of the lesson. But I imagine he really offended those whom he called the cows of Bashan, Amos 4.1. And if you want to get a reading of how he describes him further, just go read it. And somebody said, you need to go to, go to one of these schools so you can learn tact. Third, Amos' message was not necessarily his preference. Oh, he was willing to speak God's will. And we're looking at the courage it took to do it and his opposition to everybody that was living contrary to God's will. But, you know, some, you can't get some people to believe this, but some folks preach what has to be preached regardless of what the consequences are because it's the right thing to do. And Amos was one of those people. When God showed him visions that signified the destruction of the people, he actually protested. Lord God, please pardon. How can Jacob stand? For he is small. Amos 7, 2, 7, 4. A lot of the times, in fact many times, people just cannot understand why the Lord's church and all that it's described to be, members in particular in the New Testament, and the way it was, especially in the days of my forefathers years ago, were always, as the denominations put it, well, they're always sputing with everybody. And they would say the church of Christ is like Ishmael, his hands against every man. And yet what was being offered was that which saved men's souls. And Stephen knew what was, that was like. They killed him for trying to save the soul. In other words, Amos didn't want these prophecies about these wicked people to come true. But of course, he eventually couldn't protest, and he never protested the truth. He actually was interceding on these people's behalf. Once God introduced a plumb line into the vision, Amos 7, verses 7 and 8, and that sets up a clear, fixed standard, an objective standard. Amos understood why God was right to punish the people that the prophet first hoped would be spared. So God, in effect, is explaining that they've had the truth for all these years, and you're not the first prophet to have come to them. They've been taught and taught and rebuked and exhorted, but they keep on going their own way, so they will be destroyed and it's your job to tell them that. Fourth, Amos' message was unwelcome. That's to say the least. You got that for what Amaziah had to say. Go, you seer, flee away to the land of Judah, but no longer prophesy at Bethel, for it's a sanctuary of the king, a royal residence. You just can't say these things to people like him. Fifth, Amos' work of prophesying was uncompensated. He didn't get paid for doing all this. He did it because he loved God. He loved the things of God. That's what some people can't understand either. They've always got to attach a material thing of benefit to what some people do who are lovers of God. You know, when you look at Job, the only reason he was doing what he was doing in service to God is because God is God and all that implies. The devil tried to say, no, no, he, he serves you because you bless him. You take that away and he won't serve you. And a great many of people who aren't dedicated to God, like the Bible says they ought to be, they can't conceive of people just needlessly getting themselves in hot water. There, there, there must be some ulterior motive. There must be some physical benefit. There must be something they're getting out of it because that's the way they think and that's the way they would operate. Amaziah suggested, well, it was a strong suggestion, that Amaziah, that Amos go to Judah, go back where you came from. And you notice he said, and there eat bread and there do your prophesying, Amos 7, 12. Well, there's an implication in that. That implies that he needed to go to Judah if he hoped to be compensated for his work in prophesying because there'd be no such support in Israel for it. And that's one reason Amos says, 
I, I'm, not, I'm not a prophet in the sense of professional prophet. I work on the farm. I'm here doing this because God told me to, and I'm not going to disobey God. Amos was not a prophet because he received support. Amos 7.14 he did the work even though he received no financial compensation for it. In America, that is hard for some people to understand because we like financial compensation for everything we do. But then Amos took courage, being a prophet in the literal sense because that's what he was doing, was prophesying. Amos received the word of God directly from the Holy Spirit and thus he had no problem knowing what was right for him to do in service to God. Peter talks about the prophets being born along in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 by the Holy Spirit and that it was not all themselves that they said what they said. Amos believed it was better for him to serve the Lord than to enjoy the benefits of ser serving a wicked king. If he simply prophesied what Jeroboam would have liked to hear, he may have been able to eat bread at Jeroboam's table, Amos 7, 12 and 1 Kings 18, 19. But he made a conscious, deliberate decision to choose instead to be faithful to the Lord no matter what the consequences and reveal his message without compromise. And finally, Amos took courage and spoke out. Now again, no formal training, no compensation, but he obeyed God in prophesying what God gave him to prophesy. It wasn't because he had nothing else to do. He could have been back home doing plenty as a herdsman. That was his livelihood. That's what he loved to do. He left that which he enjoyed and he put the kingdom of God first. A lesson that seems to have been meant, missed by a great many members of the church. So he went where God called him and sent him to go, Amos 7, 15. Well, now reading all of this, I know it was written for our learning who are under the authority of Christ in the New Testament. And we've already done some of it. What is the application of this for the Lord's church? Well, of course, we don't have a direct operation of the Holy Spirit working on us. We have the Scriptures. That furnish us completely to every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. If you're faithful, you know what you're about. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. We have the wherewithal to know what is right and wrong. To oppose the wrong. And uphold the right. And expose error. And reveal the truth. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. For the person who takes the Bible, studies it correctly, and ascertains the will of God for his life and the lives of all others. So we can make these proper applications today. And what is it? You know, from the world standpoint, and many members of the church, our message is against everybody. Of course, in reality, the gospel we preach is for everyone's good, their eternal good. Mark 16, 15, Acts 10, 34 through 35. But when you love certain things, especially having things your own way, or you have your mind set a certain way, and you hear something that goes contrary to it, and that something is coming from a preacher, preaching from a Bible that you admit is the Bible, but it's saying things to you you don't like then it's awful easy to oppose the messenger. Even though you know it's in the Bible, just open your own Bible up and read it, and it'll, it'll read the same way. Yet that person will be perceived as being against everyone, against the atheist, because we affirm that he's a fool who says there's no God, Psalm 14, 1, Romans 1, 20 against the world religions because we declare that salvation is only in Christ, Acts 4 and verse 12. And you think specifically against the Jews for Jesus himself said, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins, John 8 verse 24. Against denominations because we teach that there's just one church 
that Jesus built and it can be restored today and its identifying marks are found in the New Testament Matthew 16 18 and also that every church built upon the commandments and doctrines of men are go is going to be uprooted Matthew 15 13 and yes even against those brethren who love certain errors uh, we're against them what they forget is is that when people go contrary to God's will whatever the error is God is against them that's what they didn't get it that day and time. He doesn't want to be against them. He loves them. But God being God and all that that implies knows what's best for everybody. But man being a free moral agent and caught up in the flesh, he likes to do things his way. So the foregoing we've just mentioned is the case because we implore the ones who have left their first love and are dead spiritually to repent, return to the Lord on His terms, Revelation 2, 4, and chapter 3, verse 1. To follow the New Testament pattern, 2 Timothy 1, 13. And do everything by the authority of Jesus Christ as revealed in the Word of God, Colossians 3, 17. You see, all that means I hate you. And everybody else that preaches it means I hate you. That's what it comes down to. And that sounds like Ahab. When Jehoshaphat said, after all of those other prophets of Ahab said, well, go ahead and go to the fight. You're going to be the victor. Joseph had said, well, is there another prophet? Ahab said, yeah, there's another one, but he does always prophesy evil concerning me. People haven't changed. But when we walk in the footsteps of Amos, and all faithful servants of God is given by the Bible, ultimately and finally the greatest is Jesus. Although our message may not be popular, not even to certain brethren, as Amos could not, we cannot stop speaking and we will not stop speaking about the Word of God, Acts 4.20 and all of its particular points. There is a time to be stubborn with the truth. And I don't know how anybody ever gets through anything when it comes to living like the Bible says and not be determined to do it, let come what may. Second, our message will not be seen as being politically correct. Probably the most notable example of not being politically correct is teaching what the Bible says about homosexuality. That it's unnatural, it's filthy and indecent, and it's contrary to God, and people are going to go to hell over it. Romans 1, 26-27. And that there's a way out of it. That some in the first century were homosexuals, but they became Christians. And they ceased to live that way because they repented and obeyed the gospel. It is unrighteous. And it will keep people out of the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. It's contrary to sound doctrine. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 10. Now you can put any other error, moral or religious, into this. There's going to be somebody not like you for it. Somebody hates you for it. Many will be offended by one who teaches what I've just said. Even many in the religious world who name God as their Father and Jesus as their Savior and the Bible as the Word of God. But we have no choice if we would serve God and go to heaven but to preach the whole counsel of God. Acts 20 verse 27. It doesn't make any difference where it offends other people. We need to learn not to offend God. Amos did. That was written for me to understand. That I shouldn't offend God. We have far more knowledge of God and godly things than Amos ever did in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Our message, like Amos' message, may not be our preference. It might be nice to believe that salvation could be by Oh, by faith only, or that once one saved, it's impossible for him to be lost. We could believe in the eternal security of more of our friends and, and family that way. But these ideas are contrary to the Word of God. James 2, 24. Hebrews 4, 11. When people say that faith alone saves, and I see that faith alone is a dead faith, what am I to believe? What my friends and pious, unimmersed people teach. 
Or do I go with the truth of God that I can read and understand and God put it here for me to read and understand? We must speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4.11 Because our way, independent of being influenced by the Scriptures, is not better than God's way. It will only lead to eternal destruction. Proverbs 14.12 Next of all, our, this is our fourth point, our message is often unwelcome. Many will not want to hear what we have to say. But should that stop us from saying it? Paul said, for am I now seeking uh, the favor of men, basically what he was saying, or am I seeking please God? He said, if I was trying to please men, then I, I would not be a servant of God. Galatians 1.10 we need to remember that the message of the gospel is not designed to please men. It ought to please them. We wish they were of the disposition of mind and heart that it was what they were looking for and they were hungering after it and they wanted it. But it's not always the case. It is designed to save men, Romans 1.16. But getting people from a state of being lost in sin to being saved by love of truth and belief in Christ and obedience to the gospel may involve a lot of things in that person's life. Fifth, we must not, we must not speak out in the hopes of obtaining some financial gain. Even for those who dedicate their lives to the preaching of the gospel, while it is right for them to get their living from the gospel, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 14, they may not always receive such support as Paul did in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, 12, and 18. But regardless of whether one is a gospel preacher or just a Christian teaching his friends or family or co-workers, we should not be motivated by the hope of gaining something in this life, whether it's actual currency or what we might get out of it. Instead, we're to store up treasures in heaven, Matthew 6, 20. And that may involve opposing people, having people mad at us, not liking us, losing friends, losing family. And we're to press on toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3.14. That's more important than anything else. Everything you can behold with your five senses, experience with them, it's all going to be gone someday. It's all going to be gone. But those who love the Lord and keep His commandments and all things pertaining to the heavenly kingdom will be here forever. We strive to persuade men not to receive some material reward, but to help prepare as many as we can for their appointment before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 through 11. Although Amos had a message that was offensive and unwelcome, God's man spoke out. Despite the fact that he had no allies and no financial support to ease his burden, Amos spoke out. And even though God called him to deliver a message of judgment that he wished himself was not true, Amos spoke out. What do we learn? We better learn whatever it is this book was put in the Bible to teach us. And help us in the church today to live righteous lives. Let's learn from Amos' example as well as the example of the other faithful prophets. So that we'll be able to have the courage to speak out. No matter what the consequences might be for the cause of Jesus Christ. If it's possible for us to be thinking rationally. In a matter of minutes before we leave this world. What are you going to be thinking about? I don't think it's going to be house payments and Social Security and groceries. All those things. It's going to be that I'm about to step over into a vast, unending eternity. There's only one of two places I'm going. It's all depending on how I lived on this earth. 
I'll either go to eternal torment following the judgment or eternal life. That's it. And that's all dependent on how I live here. Amos set an example of courageous living, of leaving things of this life that was important to him even when he wasn't a professional and going to do what God told him to do because it was the right thing to do and it would get him to where we all say we want to be and that is eternal glory with God in heaven and a body resurrected to be like our great Savior, Jesus Christ. So what is your situation? How do you think? What are you going to do tomorrow? If I were to start going down the line, what are you going to be planning? What are you going to do tomorrow? Well, you're already thinking about that. You thought about it probably, well, I don't know. Could have been thinking of it last week, which you had to do Monday. I don't know. But you won't be thinking about that the day that you lay down to die. There's a matter of minutes before you enter eternity and you know the end's come. You will not be thinking about those things. But you'll be thinking about eternity. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we hope that you will seriously take these things and let them build another knowledge of God's will. And if there's any need to correct things in your life, that you'll do so. Come to the Lord while we stand and sing.